Well, the commons can be talked about on many different levels. I think most basically, it's about shared resources that a given community wants to manage for the collective benefit of everyone. And there's usually an accent, accent on fairness uh, and sustainability of the resource. Uh, so this applies to everything from open source software and Wikipedia and open access scholarly publications to uh, subsistence commons of forestry, forests, fisheries, uh, irrigation water in developing countries, say. It also can apply to urban spaces, people, the, the Reclaim the City movement, people who want urban gardens and uh, spaces for public use instead of private development. So it's really a very diversified uh, movement, really, internationally, where people are choosing to talk about commons as a way to assert certain interests uh, over and against, in particular, the neoliberal economic policy regime, which wants to privatize and commodify everything. So the commons is both, in some ways, a political critique, but also a way of managing resources. And it's a, it's a general description. And of course, we can talk about many specific types of resources that are managed as commons. And it, it'll vary from one place to another, from one resource to another. Well, there was a famous essay written in 1968 by a biologist called Garrett Hardin, who said that if you have a pasture, nobody, no individual will have a rational reason for holding back, and so he or she will put as many cattle on the common as possible. And this will lead to its over-exploitation and destruction, the so-called tragedy of the common. Well, this has been shown to be false for a number of reasons. First, he wasn't describing a commons. He was describing an open access regime uh, for natural resources or a free-for-all in which there was no community, no rules, no monitoring, no punishment of people who abuse the resource. Uh, Professor Eleanor Ostrom, who died just a few months ago and won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2009, uh, spent much of her career demonstrating that commons are an entirely sustainable way of managing shared resources. And this was based on exhaustive uh, field work, uh, mostly on smaller natural resource commons. But the point is, uh, commons are an entirely uh, successful, feasible model for managing resources. And I might add, even more so in the digital realm, where the resource isn't finite and depletable. Uh, in fact, the more people who participate on digital commons, the more value is created. So if anything, you don't have a free rider problem with digital commons. You have the more the merrier. Uh, and the issues of management are quite different. It's not about preventing usage. It's about organizing or curating it in an intelligent way and preventing the trolls or vandals from uh, destroying the shared resource. And we see this in Wikipedia, which has developed an extremely elaborate uh, governance system for managing more than 70,000 uh, active volunteers around the world. I, I think this is a phenomenal socio-political story of how you can have that kind of a scalable global governance system outside of formal government or the market and have a successful uh, management system. So I, I think that we're really just starting to scratch the surface about how, uh, in, in understanding how commons work. Theoretically, yes. I think there's nothing intrinsic to a resource that says it can't be used as a commons. It's more the social construction and rules that we, just, we make for ourselves. Yes, some resources like water or uh, fisheries have limits or they, re they renew in different ways, uh, which is quite different, of course, from digital resources. But this is about a matter of how the community constitutes itself, what social practices they adopt for managing the resources, what values, rituals, customs they develop. So I think it's far more malleable uh, than we may imagine. Uh, so I, and, and so I think that is really our challenge, is to try to devise these systems and then to theoretically understand them better. We've made a lot of, uh, Eleanor Ostrom and others have made a lot of progress. People like uh, Lawrence Lessig and uh, Yohai Benkler of Harvard have also done a great service in helping us understand the deeper principles.
But uh, absolutely, commons are a very versatile governance mechanism. Well, I think it has been taken up more. It just hasn't been made as legible by uh, standard economics or public policy. I mean, if you start to enumerate the commons, first of all, the internet is a vast hosting infrastructure for commons, and it's arguably easier to create a commons online than a market. Let's remember that markets require legal contracts, talent recruitment, talent promotion, uh, investment in all sorts of ways. Uh, it's expensive to have a market, but uh, and many many important things require that kind of uh, market apparatus. But a commons can be extremely lightweight. It's simply a group of people that say we want to work together and we trust each other and we have these shared purposes. And many of the more important commons we have today, including Wikipedia, uh, started as little uh, small embryos of people who, as they say in the software world, had an itch to scratch, which over time proved to be um, attractive to many more people. So if you want to enumerate some of the larger classes of commons in the digital space, we have free and open source software. We have the Wikipedia, but also hundreds of wikis. We have collaborative websites and archives. We have open source, uh, um, open access uh, academic journals, more than 8,000 of them right now. We have the blogosphere, which it might be individually owned as a blog, but it's a community that's interlinked. And one could go on and on trying to suggest the different typologies of commons online. As I say, uh, so much of the attention is focused on markets online that we don't even, I think, appreciate the full value of social collaboration uh, on the internet. I, I, there's clearly uh, a flourishing proprietary software business, but if you look sector by sector, much of it is based around an open source platform and the business model is based upon uh, value added around that, that commons, you might, commons of code. Because uh, it's indisputable that the collective collaboration in producing the code is a more evolvable, uh, attractive way to produce quality code. There's no question there's always going to be a role for those niche-specific uh, value added around the commons. Um, so, you know, it's, in some ways it's a moving target. I think you are somewhat right in terms of uh, software moving to the cloud, where it's becoming a little more possible to lock up the code, to create artificial uh, proprietary gates around one software and not have it as collaboratively created as when the, the desktop was the, uh, the platform of choice. I think that once you start to talk about government regulation, you've almost given away half the battle because we know who's the dominant, more powerful players in that. I think the wave of the future is going to be trying to internalize governance within voluntary communities so that the production, consumption, and the governance itself is folded into the platform so that the platform can be both commons-based but also replic self-replicable and not appropriatable. That's, of course, what free software tried to do, but as the infrastructure started to uh, envelop it or make it less, less uh, powerful, the cloud is, of course, you know, eclipsed it in a way. This is a big challenge. Now, I, I think there is always going to be a need for those political struggles, those regulatory and legal battles to contain monopoly or oligopoly capitalism. But I think the proper counter response to maintain the openness and the commons, which I might add are not the same thing, uh, will will uh, can only be achieved by internalizing it on the platform itself. Well, I mean, the beauty of the internet was that it was originally designed, uh, embedded a lot of these commons-based principles as an infrastructure by the people who created it in the first place. And uh, it was only as the significance and scale of the internet grew larger 
that governments and others said, well, we gotta get a grip on this. Uh, and uh, now I think there's the beginning of a more serious struggle to, by nation states via people like the ITU to get a little control over it by traditional state authorities and international bodies. I think there's going to be a legitimate uh, political fight over this because the openness of the internet is precisely what has engendered and given rise to so much innovation, so, much, uh, so many of these commons, to a different kind of culture. Uh, so I think the ITU and others understand there's political danger from doing this in, a, in the kind of um, brutal way that we saw, for example, with the ACTA Treaty, where it was done in secret and privileged participation, not open participation, and so forth. So in some ways, I, it's, it, we're due for a political discussion about the governance of the internet. In, in other ways, I would just as soon keep it uh, embedded in the code rather than something that's manipulative through political processes at the international scale, which are notoriously resistant to the average user's participation. In, in other words, the, the deck is stacked against us if that's the venue in which the future of the internet will be decided. I think it's mostly in specialized circles because certain political players, nation states, many international players, uh, feel the most endangered or vulnerable from an open platform like the internet. I mean, the internet is a commons hosting infrastructure because of the shared protocols that it uses. And so if you use the internet, you're implicitly using these shared protocols to cooperate on the basis of those protocols. And that's been a fantastically generative um, productive model for getting things done. Uh, but it's also uh, had a shift in power from centralized, hierarchical, less accountable institutions, less transparent institutions. So uh, it's understandable that some of those traditional institutions have misgivings about the power of, of uh, the Internet as a commons. I do think that the culture of openness and commons are, uh, have consolidated and uh, become self-aware of themselves. And the defeat, or at least the, re the retreat of the ACTA Treaty is an example of that coming together. Such an interesting alliance between uh, companies based on open platforms like Google and Facebook and the rest, uh, industries that are arguably fair use industries that require uh, the building upon what came before, and uh, commoners of all stripes, as well as many social, uh, social actors. I think this is in some ways the massing of a cultural battle that's manifesting itself politically. Um, it's, I think that the powers that be, if you want to paint them with such a broad brush, are now warned that they have to respect a certain social consent. Social consent will be earned in a different way than through representative democracy alone. Uh, and I think the Pirate Party is an example of saying, you know what, consent has a different dimension than voting every two or four years. It has a more conversational back and forth dimension. And furthermore, uh, that other side of the conversation that was neglected for so long uh, can bite back because it can make itself heard publicly. It can organize itself the way we've seen Occupy and the Arab Spring and the Indignados in Spain and so forth. And so in some ways, well, I, my, the subtitle of my book, Viral Spiral, was How the Commoners Built a Digital Republic of Their Own. I think we're seeing the rise of a kind of different type of digital republic that poses challenges politically and in terms of governance and policy to the conventional nation state and the regulatory bureaucratic structures of it. Well, your question really zeroes in on a not often explored difference between open platforms and commons. Because an open platform 
is in general, I think, a very positive development. It provides access that often was not possible before. And we've seen the proliferation of both uh, of, of uh, innovative businesses based upon open platforms. You know, terrific. However, we also see that the business models don't necessarily lead to a civic or cultural emancipation, especially if it leads to concentration uh, of the sort we see with, with Google. Google has provided many important things in, uh, for example, the digitizing of books, but it's also true they come with certain conditions and hooks that serve their business model interests, their proprietary interests. By contrast, a commons on an open platform is a more um, non-market entity serving long-term interests that uh, cannot be taken private or necessarily monetized in that way without the consent of the commoners themselves. So open access journals that a discipline, academic discipline creates will be in per perpetuity available to everyone. This is different from having uh, hooks and conditions and pay me more kind of situations. Or for that matter, uh, the ability to data mine people's personal information the way a lot of these large platforms have. So uh, my point is we need to pay attention to how to construct defensible commons with both legal, technological, and social uh, boundaries around them. Uh, in medieval times in the English commons, they used to have an annual festival of, called Beating the Bounds, where the entire community would have a party and walk the perimeter, and anybody who had put up an enclosure of a wall or a hedge, they'd knock it down. And it was their way of defending their shared resource as a kind of public uh, ritual. Well, I think we need more beating of the bounds of digital commons, and that requires a certain imagination uh, of the sort we saw with free software uh, a generation ago. I think we need to develop these new types of uh, of practices if we're going to have more secure digital commons versus simply open platforms that can evolve into behemoth companies uh, setting the terms of governance. I think you're, you're largely correct, which I think points to that this may not be simply another business model or governance thing but the need for new types of infrastructure protocol to enable these ty types of governance. Uh, I'm associated with a group called idcubed.org in Cambridge, Mass., which is trying to develop what it calls a social stack of protocols for the Internet, which would enable user control, user control of data and uh, the development of uh, secure digital identities, which could allow people to collaborate in what we call trusted frameworks. Uh, in, in other words, you could have scalable, trustable uh, interactions with people beyond simply passwords and the usual kind of web system. So the problem you pointed to, I think, is partly a symptom of the limited protocols we have uh, for evolving different types of cooperation. I do think it's entirely feasible to have this, these different types of collaboration uh, in both market and non-market ways. In, th in fact, I think we're seeing a blur we will see a blurring of market exchange with com uh, commons exchange. They're both versions of social exchange, one of which happens to involve money and maybe property rights, the other which is non-market. But my only point is um, the, uh, the nature of the network, I think, is predisposed to this kind of social collaboration we just haven't figured out how to prevent it from being captured and privatized and, and keep it scaling. Network neutrality remains, I think, a central issue because so much depends upon it. If, if the telecom or cable carriers can discriminate through paid prioritization, for example, or if wireless can start to be locked up, or if it becomes, simply starts to be turned into a, uh, a vehicle for that kind of discrimination of transmission or selling, you start to sabotage the very bottom-up innovation that has made the, innovation, the Internet so robust, not only culturally, but economically. Uh, so net neutrality is a, a, a sort of uh, a supremely important issue that we need to prevail upon. Uh, you know, given some of the disappointing directions the U.S. has gone 
uh, I'm not sure how this is going to play out because there's a lot of concentrated power that really just wants to convert the internet into a more domesticated commercial entity rather than the open thing that it has been. I think you're basically right in your analysis, but I do think that the commoners tend to have more resourcefulness, passion, and ultimately ingenuity than the other side. And furthermore, they're all citizens who uh, ultimately will culturally express themselves. And, and we've seen how those platforms have been used to fight oppression from China to, to Egypt and, and many other countries. So I guess uh, I don't mean to be uh, sentimental or um, have rose-colored glasses, but I do think that there is that kind of bottom-up ingenuity will prevail ultimately uh, in trying to counter these things. It's just, it will be a struggle, and it, it is a struggle. Well, I think there's two problems. One, uh, there is this confusion between open platforms and commons as perhaps equivalent, but as we've seen, open platforms can be used for not so uh, competitive or innovative reasons. Uh, so because of that, I think we haven't had a clarified commons agenda. On top of that, there isn't a whole lot of resources or self-awareness for developing a policy agenda, let's call it, that has that focus on the, the reproducibility of our shared resources. Uh, there's almost too much attention on simply the market dimensions of the equation as opposed to the civic and cultural and sharing what, we, what belongs to us. Uh, so I think there is a certain burden that people who identify with the commons have to shoulder in clarifying, packaging, enumerating those uh, essential policy uh, agenda items. I mean, I think many of them are there. They haven't been let's just say, synthesized and coordinated, and many of the constituencies for them remain somewhat scattered, not brought together. I like to think that in whatever a messy way, the Pirate Party, the Occupy forces, and others are trying to express this and develop viable political institutions. Uh, that, too, is a struggle. Uh, but that's how I see the commons playing it out in these policy arenas. If it gets more acute, uh, the, the enclosures of internet and digital commons, it could well galvanize greater uh, energy. I, certainly, certainly we need that. And one of the interesting things about the commons is that it's becoming an international phenomenon where people are self-choosing to talk in that framing and discourse. We have free culture people in Brazil, one of the first free culture nations, one might say. We have uh, subsistence farmers in the Philippines, uh, who, many of whom are, there's, there's something called the system for rice intensification, which is like open source agriculture, where they trade advice. We have uh, you know, hackers in Amsterdam. We have uh, uh, reclaimed the city people in Stuttgart. There's a many different manifestations of the commons. and. I think they're starting to find each other and understand some of their shared concerns despite very different resources and national traditions. So I think that I see the commons discourse starting to, to uh, grow and become more crystallized as we move forward. And I think to the extent that the digital community of commoners can find these other uh, subsets or tribes of commoners, there can be some fantastic innovation that can occur because there's a lot of environmental problems that could use the ingenuity of digital commoners in uh, helping to understand how we can manage those resources better. So what I'm saying is there's uh, a lot of interesting synergies that are emerging uh, once you see the world through the commons lens.